Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome back to Watches Live here on Watchbox Reviews, which is filmed in Watchbox Studios. Super meta, I know, but we've got an awesome selection of watches on the table tonight. All styles, all price points, everything from platinum to steel. We have multiple enamel pieces, and you have one last week to win the Rolex Milgauss. The 116400 GV, the green crystal, full boxes, full papers, our first ever international raffle, but you gotta be in it to win it. The bottom line is I'm drawing this coming Monday, and hell or high water, that's when you're gonna find out who wins. If it's not you, Blame yourself for not signing up. Jumping in, true lie, I could see Karsten Lund joining from Denmark. We've got McKinley Stevens from Tampa. Giuseppe's joining in. Hi, Giuseppe. John Watch Smith joining from Harrogate, UK. And Sebastian T joining us from Vienna. Everyone in Europe who's staying up late, thank you so much. Okay, let's jump right into what I promised you. I promised you Rolex and I promised you HYT. I know, those two things have almost nothing in common other than they tell time. Let's start with the Rolex and let's do a quick side by side shot of an old school 40 millimeter Sea Dweller 16600 and the HYT H0 Gold Blue. We're gonna start with the Rolex and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why a lot of folks are going back to this model. It's been out of production for a while and it gave the Deep Sea a bad reputation as the watch that killed off the Sea Dweller 40. Well, the 16600 is a lovely piece, easy to wear, 40 millimeters, no Cyclops eye on the dial side because of the extra thickness of the crystal on the Sea Dweller, helium escape valve as ever. Now the watch is thick at 14.6 for a Rolex, that's almost Tudor size, but you could see the shape of the case back. See how cupped it is? Once it's on your wrist, it sits a hell of a lot lower. And you can see that it is quite low, almost like a sub, visually almost indistinguishable, except it doesn't have that notable wart of the Cyclops eye. It is a lovely 1220 meter piece that is still very swimmable and very diveable. It, this is a P-series watch from 2000. It's almost like owning a vintage Rolex that can also be used as originally intended. You don't want to dive with your 60s and 50s Submariners, but this can absolutely take the plunge this summer. My wrist 16 centimeters for reference. Now, in 2011, HYT as a brand emerged from its stealth mode of nearly a decade's worth of R&D. In 2012, HYT started selling its very first watches, and in 2017, it launched the H0 case that you see right here. This is the H0 Gold Blue. Guess why? The watch is 48.8 millimeters in diameter, but like a 1970s lugless style, it has absolutely no lugs. So this actually winds up being narrower lug to lug than the solid end link Rolex that you just saw. That's 50, this is 48.8. It has an incredible domed sapphire that is almost like the cover of a cake. And you can see how little of the case is actually the 2N yellow gold case. Now the yellow gold model was new for 2018. Obviously you can get stainless steel. They'll oblige you either way. But I actually like the look right here as a sort of Miami special with that extraordinary Laguna Seca blue, I know, wrong coast, with the 2N yellow gold. Now the thing about 2N yellow gold, if we can get super close Harrison, is that it has the faded pale appearance of a vintage gold watch that has lost a little bit of its original intensity. It's a gorgeous style that is both sandblasted and satin finished. And you can see the timepiece on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist is getting nowhere near overcoming the edges of my wrist. I recommend if you have a smaller wrist and you're thinking HYT, go H0. Now, this is actually the first of a series of friend of the brand appearances where I have invited a series of manufacturers to take a chance and send me the watch. No fee, no money changes hands. I just get to showcase cool watches and they get the exposure of being on sort of a subversive viral platform. So HYT, one of the few independents that actually took a chance with me, I embrace their audacity in embracing a YouTuber. Now, let me show you how the regulator dial works. It is a series of immiscible liquids. There's actually two. There's a piston style bellows system on the case back and the mechanical movement actually pumps the bellows. One contains the clear liquid, one contains the blue liquid. Now the cool thing here is that it is both a regulator and a retrograde. As you can see, as I turn the minute scale at 12 o'clock, that blue liquid, which corresponds to hours of the day, advances along its track. So this watch is one of the few that's actually created from the outset 
with liquid inside. Now you see, once you reach the end of the 12 hours of the first half of the day, it has a dramatic retrograde bounce back. So it goes all the way back to zero and starts its next 12 hour sweep. I adore these watches, and this is an interesting brand out of Neuchatel that's only doing a few hundred pieces a year. I deeply dig what they're up to, and I love the fact that their watches cannot be mistaken for anything else. While I love and respect Rolex, uh, you can easily mistake those for anything else. Jumping into the chat box right here. I can see we've got F Freddie Turner, greetings from London. I can see it's DC Tube saying it's like wearing a giant button on your wrist. It is a little bit. And I can see that we've got some friends joining in from around the world. It's DC Tube saying, wow, that HYT is insane. I have a more insane HYT. True Lie saying he picked up his Oyster BLNR from the AD last month and his brother just picked up his own BLNR on Jubilee from the same AD. Feeling super lucky. Yeah. That's congrats, but wow, uh, at the same time, no less. And here's the other thing right here. Eric Nielsen saying, I'm really considering the 16600. Unfortunately, I think yours is a little bit expensive. Well, call us up, see what we can do. We're all about making deals. This isn't the boutique. We are flexible on pre-owned Rolex prices. Jumping back into the watches on the table. Okay, we've shown you the extreme watch. Now let me show you a more traditional watch. This is the Patek Philippe Millennial that is year 2000. Millennium Reference 5100, 34 millimeters wide by 46 millimeters lug to lug in white gold. This is a 10 day chronometer. That's right, it is a chronometer certified Patek Philippe with a lovely Manta style case inspired by Patek's own history. And you could see that the watch features a lovely cambered crystal to match the cambered case. Incredible contours on these lugs and the bat wing, or I should say Manta style flanks of the case. Now it's easy to wear on a small wrist. They made 450 of these in white gold. They made 1,500 in yellow. They made 750 in rose, 450 in white gold, and 150 in platinum. Turn it all over, and Harrison, get as close as you can right there. You can see the caliber 2820 REC, 10-day power reserve, manual wind, Geneva hallmark, finger-style bridges for the train like an old pocket watch. One, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine jewels set in Chaton, including both of the mainspring barrels. This is an absolutely stunning piece, bewitching. I would even say spellbinding with that sunburst blue dial and the 10 day power reserve up at 12 o'clock. This is as good as Patek gets. And believe it or not, you can pick these up for less than people are paying for some Nautilus in steel. You don't have to ask me which I would choose. I would be all about this 5100G. Jumping into the box right here, I can see we've got Sebastian T saying he prefers a JLC Reverso over that Patek. Well, that's good because the Reverso is going to cost a lot less money. So you could definitely get one. The Patek, for me, is the way to go. And I've owned some of the finest Reversos. I don't know if I loved any of them the way I love this 5100G. And I can see right here, we got Russell 996 saying they made 300 in PT, in PT not 150. Good gouge, Russell. I appreciate that. And then we got Jeremy Sims. Thoughts on JPEG watches shown at watch time? I like them a lot. They're honest about their suppliers. They put the name of their dial manufacturer on their dial. They put the manufacturer of their movements right in the press release, right on the about pages of their watches. They work with the best dial suppliers. JLC works with Metal M2, but they won't tell you that. And they work with Chronode, which is a great way to work if you want the absolute best movements in the business. HYT, for example, works with them. They also work with Vauche, which is part of the Parmigiani family of companies, and that's for the chronograph. You're going to get a great watch when you buy a JPEG. I recommend the Rainforest Green Keda Berg in stainless steel. That is the one I would buy. Uh, I think that is probably the most... Uh, a versatile watch they've got. Seven day power reserve, and I think I might have mispronounced that. That's the Quai de Berge, and it's just a lovely watch with a green dial with real rose lathe guilloche. Love it. Okay, jumping in here, we got Yahia B joining from Egypt. Thank you for joining in from Egypt and staying up super late. And I can see right here, Mark S. Tim, when is Swatch going to light the 2019 fireworks? I don't know, but I'm arranging to get their new watches on uh, this chat. Well, yeah, this channel, Watchbox Reviews. It'll be under the Govberg banner, but it'll be on this channel. And we will have full reviews of the 2019 collection as soon as Omega is willing to show them. Okay, here's a watch that I love. And I was going to go from Audemars Piguet to Zenith and end with Zenith. But I'm going to show you this right now. 42 millimeters. This is an El Primero chronograph perpetual calendar in 
red gold, part of the 2012 class of all new Zenith references under jean frederic Dufour, who later went on to run Rolex on the strength of his Zenith work. Uh, this watch is post and a taff. It is the caliber 4003 automatic chronograph perpetual calendar, but rather than the 45 millimeter cases of Nataf, this is a very wearable 42. An elegant and versatile perpetual calendar chrono. It is a lovely timepiece with the Chronomaster style case, and it fits easily on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. Now I have a counterpoint to this watch. If you want a flyback chronograph and you're willing to trade your perpetual calendar for an annual, you might want to consider the 2013 variant of the Patek Philippe 5960R. This is the 2013 variant with white opaline dial, rose gold case, 40 millimeters, annual calendar with a flyback chronograph. This is an easier watch to wear on a smaller wrist. I'm not going to lie, though broad and large lug to lug for a Patek, it is still a more wearable watch than the 42 millimeter Zenith. It's it's nice and low on the wrist. It's a graceful dress watch, but it's not too traditional with that tropical white dial. It looks lovely and it's a youthful, I would say red gold white dial combo. So if you're gonna wear colored gold and it is a bit of an ebbing trend, this is definitely the way to do it. It's even a loomed watch so you can see it at night. Now the movement is automatic. This is why I say I prefer traditional manual wind lateral clutch column wheel chronos. Automatic with a vertical clutch doesn't show you much, but what is there is gorgeous. Patek finishing everything without compromise. The Patek Philippe seal, so you know it'll keep time to minus three plus two seconds per day. That's Patek's attestation associated with the seal. And I like that because Patek finally found something concrete that was different about the Patek Philippe seal that you wouldn't have found on the Geneva Hallmark. You don't get an accuracy attestation with the Geneva Hallmark. Mark S, after saying, after owning a flyback, I can't imagine using a standard chronograph. And of course, since this is not a hacking movement, if you want to use the chronograph seconds hand as constant seconds, you can use the flyback to zero reset it, and then it effectively becomes a hacking Patek Philippe movement. All right, jumping back to HYT for a moment because they have a fun concept that De Batun definitely stole from them. De Batun is doing a dynamo-powered light up watch. Well, this is the H4 Neo2 Multicolor. They're doing a series of limited editions in different colors for 2019 in the H4 collection, and this one got all of the colors. So if you've ever seen the combinations jersey at the Vuelta a España bike race, where you have one tuft of each of the multicolor jerseys on one jersey, this watch is that. 15 pieces in titanium. It's black DLC, and it's nicely contrasting between polish and satin black titanium. It's a regulator style dial. It has their fascinating fluid style time display. So if you're just joining us, I'll demonstrate how this works. The green liquid actually corresponds to the 12 hours of the day. And you could see as I advance the minutes on the regulator style minute style, the green liquid advances and then it reaches the end of the 12 hour span and it rapidly retrogrades back to the beginning of its travel. Now there's a bellows style system that I showed on the H0. So it basically uses the mechanical watch as a pump for the bellows of the liquid. But this watch has something else. Back in 2015, I'm gonna do my best to cover it up, HYT debuted self-lighting watches. You wind up a separate spring in the watch and it powers two LEDs by turning a dynamo. Five second bursts of purple light and this thing is bright enough that in a perfectly dark room, you can actually use it to navigate your way around. I know, I tried. HYT, I apologize for endangering your watch. Uh, this is what you get when you take a chance on a YouTuber and send them watches for reviews. But I deeply appreciate what HYT is doing. Between these two watches, I'm not about the lug case. 51 millimeters with lugs means this wears like an IWC big pilot. That's a style for some not necessarily for me. I prefer the lugless case, and I'm definitely waiting for an H4 lugless with that lighting system. This is the H0 lugless. You can also get it in steel. So HYT taking a chance on me, and I definitely appreciate that. And I could see it's DC Tube saying, you are right, that one is way cooler than the other. And then we have uh, questions about repairs on an HYT. And I could say, because in the Watch You Want days, we did send one in for repair. It was surprisingly reasonable. It was about what I paid for a JLC chronograph. So I think like $1,500. It was very reasonable. And then we could see Christopher G saying, great theater with the HYT. Pilot style asking, can the liquid be bubbled or spread in the tube when hit hard? I've never seen it. 
Honestly, if you're not one to fracture and constantly break sapphires on your watch, you're probably never going to damage that one. And then right here, we have John Wilson saying that is a Power Ranger watch right there. And then Russell9N6 loving that green, and it lights up. And then Justin Hill saying, I don't like HYT, but dang, they really are amazing. Uh, that's a fact. And I'm going to get the whole model line. They're sending me everything they make, so you're going to see it on a series of these shows, and my reviews, and my Instagram. Which, if you haven't followed, you really should. Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. Pick up your phone, open a different window, keep me streaming. All right, let's talk about the ultimate Omega, and I mean like ever. It's not the Torbion. I cannot believe I have one of these on my wrist, but this is the 2017 Aquaterra World Timer. The Seamaster Aquaterra World Timer with a solid platinum dial with solid yellow gold indices and hands. At center, it features Grand Faux Enamel, of the world as seen from the North Pole. Harrison, get as close as you can here. I'll hold it steady. But this is a platinum dial garnished with yellow gold, centered with Grand Faux enamel. 87 pieces, limited edition, full platinum case, full platinum dial, and full platinum clasp. This is a watch, 43 millimeters, with a movement only ever made in 87 copies. You can see this is the caliber. 8939. You will find it in no other Omega movement. It features a solid gold rotor and a solid gold balance bridge. And again, they only made 87 of these. Look at this. You won't find double alligator straps on any other Omega watches. This is like F. P. Journe. This is like L. U. Chopard. This is like De Batoon. This is high grade stuff. You never see Gator on mass marketed watches. This is truly special. When you, what I mean is Gator on both sides of the strap of a mass marketed watch. You see cav on the bottom on most. This is a very special watch and probably the most impressive Omega I've ever encountered and I've seen multiple versions of the Torbjörn. That is a very cool watch. And then we have a question from Richard Combe. How much for the Omega? We haven't priced this one yet, but retail is $49.8, so I would imagine as a pre-owned watch you're going to get a chunk of change off of that, and I would imagine something like five figures off of that. Stay tuned to our website, Richard. And right here, Freddie Turner saying, Omega really teases with their super high-end like the Tourbillon. Every year, Omega releases a few dozen pieces in platinum at Basel, and back in 2017 with the Aquaterras all new, this watch was their special piece for the year. I cannot believe we have one. Now, if you want something that doesn't short you the precious metal, but takes a very different approach to its precious metal aesthetic, then you want the Rolex Oyster Perpetual Date 840 in yellow gold. Richard, this is very Miami, so tell John about this one. But 40 millimeters in yellow gold, you can see the intensity of this yellow gold. It's a darker yellow than the 2N of the HYT, which is uh, designed to look vintage. This is designed to look contemporary. You can see that roaring sunburst dial exploding in the studio lights. 40 millimeters, three-day power reserve. This is the 3255 movement, and it is 100 meters water resistant. So if you do want to wear it at Miami Beach and not just Miami, this one's good to go for a swim. This is over the top and overpowering, but with Rolex build quality, a five-year warranty from the factory, and of course, swimmability, it's a surprisingly versatile and tough timepiece. Jumping into the box, and then we got a question from Pet Shop Boy. Tim, what is your favorite Date 840 dial? I would say either the uh, the Quadrant Green Sunburst on the white gold, or the very limited Eastern Arabic Glacier Blue on the Platinum model. So if that ever shows up, and it was a Siddiqui special, it was, but it wasn't for Siddiqui. It was basically made for them. Rolex just won't admit to making a retailer special. If that ever showed up, I'd have to seriously think about it. Jumping right here, Dante Miami, appropriately named for that last watch, is saying that timepiece is super 80s. And I could see JD Tim saying, that's a tough one to couple with conservative attire. That's a fact. If you want to go conservative, and I mean super conservative, you want an Oyster Perpetual alternative from within the Rolex Tudor universe. Have you ever seen a Tudor Black Bay 36? This is truly an old school snowflake inspired, that is the hands are snowflake inspired, <clears throat> Oyster Perpetual rival from Tudor. 
So if you don't want to go Oyster Perpetual, you don't want to pay the Rolex Premium, you can pay about half the money and get this in 36. It looks more like a 38 or a 39 on the wrist, and it is a lovely piece that is super versatile and very swimmable. 150 meters, and again, the quintessential old school sports watch. Automatic, loomed, water resistant, nothing more. No date, no cyclops, no nothing. And a very comfortable piece on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. All right, let's go back to the high horology and the Jager Lecoult Duomet chronograph. I used to own one of these. I owned number, I want to say I owned number 83. This is 145 of 200. Built in 2010 in 200 copies, this is a 42 millimeter white gold case with a Foudroyant chronograph. Now get super close to the dial and you can see that Everything that's yellow gold is a chronograph hand, including the power reserve for the chronograph, because the watch has two mainspring barrels and two power reserves. One sixth of a second, chronograph seconds at center with constant seconds also at center, chronograph minutes, chronograph hours, and then there's a chronograph single digit minutes disc at the base of the chronograph dial. Stop everything, reset, turn it over. The movement is built like a longa. Caliber 380, 50 hour power reserve. You can see those two mainspring barrels I mentioned. One ratchets while the other winds. You wind them with the same crown, but in different directions. German silver bridges, that's nickel, copper, zinc. The copper gives it that golden hue. There is a Cote de Soleil or sunburst exploding out from the balance. Two separate power trains, two separate trains converging on that balance. And the lever acts as a switcher, alternating the power from each one to alternately power each of the displays, chronograph and time of day. White gold and rose gold on the front with a matte black dial. And as you can see, German silver, nickel, copper, zinc on the case back. And with wonderful depth, you look down and through this movement diagonally. It is a mono pusher column wheel chronograph, so it is very crisp. This is probably the ultimate modern JLC model and the ultimate version of the ultimate modern JLC model. Throw it on the wrist and you can see it still wears well on my wrist. I owned this piece for four years, and it was four years of bliss. It's a big watch, but it's a thin watch at 13 and a half millimeters. I love this watch. <clears throat> Pardon me, guys. I've been a little bit under the weather. Dustin Van Patten saying, dudes, I'm late, but that is a stunner JLC. I can see Fat in Space saying, beautiful movement, though. Matt Foster, great case back. Easy E. Asking any recommendations for a 38 millimeter watch? Well, if you can swing the new Patek, right, Patek, uh, I'm, I'm cutting to the chase, the new Royal Oak Chronograph, definitely consider that. Otherwise, I would say consider one of these. Launched in 2008, the Patek Philippe 5139 here in white gold. A lovely micro rotor perpetual calendar with hobnail bezel and straight welded lugs. This is a perpetual calendar with the 240 micro rotor and a lovely galvanized gray dial to go with its white gold case. Now this is a 5139 and thus wafer thin on the wrist. And that's all courtesy of a micro rotor automatic movement. Now you can see this one a little bit older school. This would have been made between 2008 and mid 2009 because it has the old Geneva Hallmark which was phased out after July of 2009. You can see the micro rotor of the caliber 240 with its own coat de Genève, engine turned perlage below on the base plate. Because the rotor is in the same plane as the rest of the bridges and the rest of the mechanism along with the train and the barrel, this is as thin as a manual. There's no winding bridge. There's no central rotor to obscure it's a gorgeous look. This is why I prefer manual wind or micro rotor for the pleasure of seeing that for which I've paid. I'll also say, if you're asking about 38 millimeter watches, get the Aquaterra 38 millimeter annual calendar in steel with the blue dial. That would be my choice in the 38 millimeter range. Jumping back into the box, I can see Justin Hill saying that Patek font looks huge on that dial. A little bit. And I can also say, uh, uh, is saying it's as thin as a strap, Russell 996, beautifully slim, but he's not sure about the hobnail. It's a good point. It's a bit divisive. Mark S. asking, what is the downside of a micro rotor? The downside can be that when not properly engineered, or if the brand is cutting costs with the weight of the winding rotor, um, you, you can have less efficient winding because it doesn't have the same effective lever action through its angular motion to wind the watch. So basically, 
If you're using 18 karat gold or tungsten, uh, you're gonna have winding issues. You wanna see 22 karat, 23 karat, 24 karat, or platinum. And Patek uses 22 karat on the 240 micro. And then Andrew saying, or any FP Jorn 38. True, not bad. Again, a little bit tough to get. If, if you're in the market for that sort of thing, you've got many, many options historically. Let's talk a little bit about a watch that's close at 40 millimeters, but features unparalleled beauty with the Donald McKay designed American built clipper ship Flying Cloud on a Ulysse Nordin San Marco Classic with cloisonne enamel dial by Donze Cadran featuring the image of the clipper ship and I'm going to actually wear this one backwards so you can see the dial right side up but 40 millimeters in platinum this is an extraordinary watch this is the definition of a simple dial taken to the max no complications no date window just the image of the flying cloud with the bone in her teeth and the night sky above this is artistry this is high horology this is handmade and excruciatingly so up to 20 firings at 800 degrees centigrade. Donze Cadran, by the way, owned by Ulysse Norden, purchased in 2012. This is in-house enamel by UN. You do have a case back through which you can see the chronometer grade, ETA 2892A2, but this one is really not about the movement, though it is a noble, accurate, and thin movement. It is all about that incredible dial, which is executed, by the way, on a white gold base. Platinum watch, absolutely stunning. Spellbinding stuff. Jumping right into the box, Christopher G saying an elegant UN, and Turkish Meister is saying that is a VC grade watch. That is like a VC execution. That dial could absolutely be Vacheron. The difference, I don't think Vacheron has the in-house enameling capability that UN has. And right here, True Lie saying, I have never seen a UN worn in the wild. Head down to South Florida, you'll see plenty. Actually, guys, I really like UN. I'm going to do a hypothetical thought experiment collector's video where I imagine what my UN collection would look like because I'm really warming up to the brand. There's a lot of stuff they do that's too weird even for me, but then there's a ton of other stuff they've done that I absolutely adore. So I'm warming up to the idea of Ulysse Nardin, and watches like that and this are part of the reason. Here you can see the 2006 99 piece limited edition stainless steel 42.7 millimeter aqua perpetual diver. Why a perpetual calendar on a dive watch? Because you mostly don't dive with your dive watch. You tend to just wear it to the office where the calendar is the everyday friendly complication. And watch design maestro Ludwig Oxlin, now of Ox und Junior, designed the perpetual calendar for this diver on a UN caliber 33. So let me show you what the Oxlin perpetual can achieve. It has the ability to set in both directions. Look at the date, look at the month, now watch as I set in either direction. It is a bi-directional perpetual calendar. You can't break it. And in the year 2100, it won't need to be sent back to the maker. You could see it gives you the year. It gives you the day. It gives you the month. It gives you a double digit date. All of that with a very cool embossed weave pattern on the dial with a rubber inlay in its unidirectional rotating bezel. 42.7 is a great size for one of these. There's a dive extension inside of the clasp, which is a great feature if you do want to wear it over a dive suit, or if you're like me and you hate water, you're just going to wear it over a thick winter coat or sweater. 42.7 is a great size for a diver. I'm not on board with UN's later 44s and 45s, but this looks great on my wrist, and it would on a small wrist, because as you can see, the lug-to-lug -lug on this watch is impossibly short. It's probably about 46 millimeters on a 42.7 diameter. I love this piece. I'm thinking of buying it. 99 pieces from 2006. And that would be the beginning of my UN collection if I decided to start. <clears throat> I suppose there have now been enough Hodinkee limited editions that you could really start building up a collection around those. For 2018, Ben Clymer reached back into his personal history, his grandpa's watch, which apparently was a reference 382053, judging by the look of this Hodinkee 10th anniversary moon watch. Now, this is not a triple calendar like that watch, but it does feature the dial scheme. A slate blue dial, 39.7 millimeter CK2998K, so if you know the CK2998, it's the size and shape of that.
that. The watch features a Moonwatch Caliber 1861. It's a 500 piece limited series. Two straps, one with a contrasting stitch in leather and one NATO style. Easy watch to wear on a small wrist. It's a wacky looking watch and you definitely have to be into the Hodinkee lifestyle and the Hodinkee extended lifestyle to totally embrace the backstory of this watch, but if you like a cool looking watch that fits well, you don't need to know anything about where this design came from. It's just a fun timepiece. The branding on this one is discreet. As you can see, it does say Hodenkey on the case back and 10th anniversary, but there's nothing on the dial side to give away the origins of this design or the branding. Jumping into the box, I can see right here, um, bump, 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 bump. We have Robert Fletcher saying that UN is a very cool watch, ticks many boxes, fad and spacing. What are the pros and cons of a rubber inlay bezel? Not too many. And Russell 9 and 6 saying he owns the blue lacquer version, the, the old Aqua Perpetual. That is a really cool watch. I regret not buying that when I had the chance. What are the pros and cons of a rubber inlay of in, in a bezel. That was popular before ceramic. The pros are it is very resilient. It won't really scratch your scuff and I found that even beyond a decade they don't vulcanize and crumble. So it's more durable than a anodized aluminum insert which used to be the standard on a dive watch. The con is that it's not quite as indelible as a piece of ceramic. So it's not as durable as it could be. It's better than what came before. It can't fracture like ceramic can but it's not quite as as indelible to any mark or discoloration as ceramic is. And then right here, John Wilson saying too many Omegas. On the table or from Hodinkee? Uh, let's talk about Longa because Longa is one of my personal favorites. This one from 2002 is a 25 piece limited series, the legendary Cellini limited edition. 25 pieces for 25 years of New York City's Cellini jewelers. It has a lacquered white gloss dial. It's made of platinum, 38.5 millimeters, 10 millimeters thick on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. This is one of the most renowned Longa One Special Series. If you're going to own the Longa, you want to own a Longa One, a Dato, or a Zeitberg. And if you're going to own a Longa One, you want one of the best. This watch is rare, special, legendary, and equipped with the equally legendary L901 movement, twin mainspring barrels, German silver bridges, three-quarter style plate, jewel set in chiton, freehand engraved half bridge, the twin barrels giving it a 72-hour power reserve beaten away at 21.6, a full platinum watch that feels eyes closed like it might be a 42. So massive is the case. It's that gloss white lacquer Cellini dial that looks like nothing else before or since from Longa, a very special piece and the piece on which I plan to conclude this episode. Hey, thanks to you guys for watching. Thanks to HYT for embracing our new collector series and featured brand concept. I really love them. And again, taking a chance on a YouTuber is the ultimate compliment by an OEM. So thank you, HYT. Definitely check their website, hytwatches.com, and our watches at thewatchbox.com. Thank you so much. Join me on Instagram at Tim underscore Masso. Time out, Tim out. And thank you for logging on. Mm -hmm.